me the money. New tonight on our news live at 7. The Bahamas Public Services Union questions the status of increments for members, claiming they've not been paid. But the Public Service State Minister says otherwise. Plus, in news from the courts, an accused murderer to be indicted as prosecutors claimed he killed two people. This as forged documents lead to a $1,000 fine for two men who pleaded guilty to the charges. Then, in our news at 7.30, put existing legislation to use. Organization for Responsible Governance says the ongoing immigration saga involving the minister, an opportunity to follow the law. Our news live at 7 starts right now. Welcome to our news live at 7. Thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Kendino Knowles. Public servants outraged over increments negotiated in the industrial agreement, which they say never came. But the public service state minister says the money was paid and on time. Bethany McDermott gets us started tonight. The Bahamas Public Services Union is speaking out as they say a number of public servants did not receive the salary increase negotiated in the most recent industrial agreement. Union President Kimsley Ferguson says he's not pleased with the way the matter is being handled. I am very concerned in relation to the nonchalant approach that was taken in relation to the salary increases that people so drastically need while the cost of living is escalating every day. And so we, we, we are hopeful that we will get an update soon. Ferguson says the response was unacceptable. Meanwhile, these public servants say they need their money. I'm unable to do what I need to do with my salary because it's still at the minimum wage um, and it hasn't increased. So now I have to wait for my next increment to receive one increment, which is we get one increment a year. Light bill, cable, food, everything going up. I soon retire, I get no like 64. I get one more year on a job, and I soon retire, I need my money, sir. We put the issue to State Minister for the Public Service, Pia Glover Rule. She says the payment was made on time as agreed to in the industrial agreement. As for those who may not have received the increase and the M-scale employees... There are some who were not paid. It's as a result of queries to their statuses that need to be addressed on a separate, under separate cover, if you call it that. Um, in regard to the BPSU's president query regarding the M-scale workers, if we would look at his agreement, it is noted that the M-scale workers' payments will begin in 2024. For those who may have outstanding queries, she says the Labor Relations Unit is working to sort out these discrepancies. So our Labor Relations Unit is in contact with the PSU and is working in tandem with the Ministry of Finance. We will get the lists of those pay payments or workers that weren't paid to the BPSU, and we'll work to get their matters ameliorated. Reporting for Our News, I'm Bertha McDermott. To news from the courts as police have charged a man with murder in two separate homicides. Prosecutors allege Leonard O'Brien killed Dario McPhee and Brian Smith. On April 10, McPhee was shot while on a boat behind Sand Trap on West Bay Street. The other victim, Smith, was shot dead at Hospital Lane on May 26. Police say he was waiting on a wall when he was ambushed by two gunmen. O'Brien didn't have to plead to the charges during his court appearance before acting Chief Magistrate Roberto Kelly, he, Reckley, that is. Now, he's expected to be indicted on October 5th. And 28-year-old Ramel Munro and 27-year-old Sean Gardner were arraigned in the magistrate's court yesterday for possession of forged documents and uttering a forged document. Prosecutors argue that back on July 24th, while conducting potential candidate interviews at the police training college, it was found the men submitted fraudulent examination certificates to the administrative office, which resulted in them being arrested and taken into police custody. Both men pleaded guilty to the charges and were fined $1,000 for each count. Now, if they do not pay the fine, they'll be subject to eight months at the Department of Corrections. Well, police operation Secure City in New Providence yesterday, leading to the arrest of five people. Officers stopped and searched 42 vehicles between 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. The five who were arrested were taken in for various offenses, including possession of dangerous drugs, warrants of arrest, organized crime, and threats of death. Well, in light of several homicides in the past few weeks, where the victim was being electronically monitored and also out on bail for murder, Attorney General Ryan Pinder 
sought to use some time in the Senate today to address the issue. He says both the Privy Council and Court of Appeal have ruled there are two instances where bail can be granted. They focus on two important areas, to protect the accused and to protect society, the public. I encourage our lower courts to study these and other cases and make the appropriate decisions in the denial of bail in appropriate circumstances. Yes. I think it important to make the point that the grant of bail is not a determination of innocence or of guilt. No. It is simply an indication that the parameters have been are, are, and are in place to assure an accused person's attendance at trial. General's comments coming during debate on the Magistrate Amendment Bill 2022. Pinder says the general public must also be mindful of vigilante justice. Vigilante activity is also a crime. And our people, by and large, should avoid the desire to retaliate against those that might have done them wrong. It's important to communicate that as well, because we see in a lot of these instances, and I gave specific examples of retaliatory activity and retaliatory killings. All right, we're learning from officials that not enough is being spent on road repairs, and we've got a whole lot more to get to, including that. But for now, it's time for your first look at temperatures. Meteorologist Greg Thompson, he's in the Weather Center. Greg, I know we've had a slight reprieve from the heat <laughs> um, with that rain that we saw yesterday causing some flooding, uh, but sun was out today. Is that expected to continue, or is it yeah. going to be mixed conditions yeah, still you know, into the we weekend? we had a couple of what, weeks of the heat? Yeah. And we got those yeah, so say it's just a cool, just a short reprieve. <laughs> we'll be back to the heat once again. You so can get it in your car and not have to, yeah. you know, turn the AC on right away. Yeah, the difference is what yeah. 24 hours make. Yeah. yeah, most of that weather is now moving across Florida. The surface trough is weakening as it pushes towards the north. We showed it in that satellite picture, but it is warm outside our studios right now, 86 degrees with a few clouds. We'll call it humid. Your winds out of the east, southeast at 12 miles per hour. Your feel like temperature is at 94. Temperatures around the islands right now, it's 85 in Freeport, 86 in Alice Town, Bimini, as well as in Nichols Town, Andros. Great Harbor Key, you guys, 87, as well as in Marsh Harbor, Abaco, 86 in Governor's Harbor. In the central Bahamas, temperatures in the mid 80s there as well, 86 is. Most locations, Georgetown, Kemp's Bay, Arthurstown, Cobra Town, San Salvador, 88, Deadman's Key, 84, and into the Southeast Bahamas. 86s in Duncan Town, Ragged Island, Colonel Hill, Cricket Island. Well, actually, the entire Southeast Bahamas, even our neighbors to the Southeast. Turks and Caicos Islands, you guys are 86 at this hour. Satellite and radar composite, most of the activity, as I mentioned, is now moving across Florida. Grand Bahama, the Abacos, portions of the uh, Berry and the Bimini area got some showers early this morning, but the activity is now pulling well towards the north. The surface trough is really across Florida, but that will continue to exit. We are watching an upper level low that's just north of Hispaniola. That's going to be moving across the area. So that's going to spell a few more showers for the weekend. But all in all, we uh, have a high pressure ridge in charge and those warm temperatures will be back with us with those triple digits. So make sure you stay prepared for that for the outdoors. That's your first look at weather. Stick with us. A look at your weekend forecast is still to come. Still to come on our news, works officials admit not enough is being spent to keep roads in tip-top shape. This as we learn how the ministry is planning to transform major roadways in tonight's work in progress segment. And later, meet the 37 protected area managers who just graduated from a BNT course. How the new class will help the environmental group strengthen conservation efforts when our news returns. I always find new ways.
A senior civil engineer in the Ministry of Works is admitting that not enough is being spent on road repairs in the Bahamas. It's resulting in the constant potholes that plague motorists daily. You've probably uh, fallen in some of those. And Francis Clark is saying that road infrastructure improvements are costly. One of the, one of the things um, what we learned during the Jose Cataloni project is that once we start to excavate, um, we don't only take into consideration um, what's on top of the surface, like the asphalt, uh, the sidewalks, uh, and street lamps, but what is, what's below the surface. Um, we, we have to ensure that uh, the water lines, water and sewer lines, B BTC lines, um, the telecommunication lines are all in ducts. Senior civil engineer was giving an update on the state of roads and repairs in New Providence at yesterday's uh, press briefing at the office of the Prime Minister, Clark saying that rain intensity has increased and that's resulted in larger potholes and road edge erosions. He says recently constructed roads were constructed by international standards, which resulted in them lasting longer. Once it rains, um, if the water has an inability to drain itself, then it will pond and um, compromise the, the sub base. And then uh, a portal can start from the size of a quarter um, into two to three feet overnight. But if you look at our newer roads, it is performing very well. All right, and still talking about roadways, long lines and cramped lanes may become a thing of the past for commuters as more upgrades are coming for a few busy thoroughfares here in New Providence. Jamila Mizek has the details in tonight's work in progress segment. The Ministry of Works and Utilities on an aggressive mission to bring some major thoroughfares in New Providence up to standard. Senior civil engineer Francis Clark tells us that several road improvement projects are on the horizon. Glastone Road, um, that's going to be dualized. And uh, we have also have the Milo Butler Highway extension, which is going to be extended from Kamiko Road all the way to Cowpen Road. And um, we're also uh, looking at um, doing some roadway improvement in the downtown areas. Um, we are carrying out some underground uh, studies, which will help us inform the design and the reconstruction of Dowswell Street. Clark also sharing what's on tap for the Milo Butler Highway Extension Project. It's going to be parallel with Faith Avenue. Okay. Um, right, so we'll be going into um, some some virgin land, um, and um, there are some residential buildings there that um, we need to um, accommodate those people who are living in there. But the designs for Milo Butler Extension is completed. Another long-awaited project is the expansion of Gladstone Road into a dual carriageway. The existing road was recently resurfaced, and Clark explains that advanced work is underway. Designs are substantially complete. Uh, what the designs have done for us so far it has informed us of where we, we, we are going to be um, diverting the existing utilities and what land need to be acquired. Um, and so this, these are called advanced works. Before we allow the contractor to mobilize that site, um, we need to have the right of way cleared first. Reporting for work in progress for our news. I'm Jamila Misek. When our news comes back from the break, we turn our spotlight to stories making headlines across the world as a dramatic coup in Niger leads to declarations of a new leader. Plus, the job advertisement by Netflix that's triggered an angry response from striking Hollywood actors and writers. And Royal Caribbean wants to raise cruise prices. The CEO explains why when our news returns.
This is our news. Welcome back. We turn our attention now to stories making headlines across the world. General Abdurrahman Shiani has declared himself the new leader of Niger after a dramatic coup. Also known as Omar Shiani, he staged a takeover that started on Wednesday when the Presidential Guards unit he led seized the country's leader. Deposed President Mohamed Bazoum was Niger's first elected leader to succeed another since independence in 1960. Bazoum is currently thought to be in good health and still held captive by his own guards. Netflix has triggered an angry response from striking Hollywood actors and writers after posting a job advertisement for an artificial intelligence expert with a salary of $900,000 a year, which further fueled the outrage. Actors and writers are striking due to concerns that AI poses a threat to the entertainment industry and pay. Netflix declined to comment about the job listing, but has previously said AI will not replace the creative process. Meta CEO Mark Zuckerberg says his new social media platform Threads that's tied to Instagram has lost more than half its users. Within five days of launch, the platform had more than 100 million users, but Zuckerberg stated those numbers have fallen. He described the situation as normal and expects retention to improve in the future. It's his version of Twitter. Royal Caribbean, Royal Caribbean's cruise prices are higher today than in 2019, and the company wants to raise those prices even more. Historically, cruise vacations have been popular because of their convenience and value, but in recent years, the cost of airfare and hotel prices have decreased relative to the increase in Royal Caribbean cruises due to its high demand after the 2020 shutdown. Royal Caribbean International CEO Jason Liberty spoke to CNBC's Simo Modi about the price gap between cruise and land vacations after their quarter two earnings call on July 27th. Take a look. We still think there's a lot of runway um, that is still there to close. And the way that our pricing environment works, it's very dynamic and it's based off of um, you know, as, you know, you know, changing prices uh, back and forth and looking at how demand is coming in. And what we see is that we continue to take on bookings while rising, pr raising prices, as well as getting our customers to book all of their onboard activities well in advance. Don't you want to maintain a value gap of some, of some magnitude to attract, to attract people and, and keep your demand up? Well, I, I, think, I, I think we always want to be um, as competitive as we possibly can be, Tyler. Um, but of course, you know, we want that gap to be uh, much smaller. We, we were able to close that gap to about 10 to 15 points pre-COVID. I mean, we think that there's a lot of opportunity for us to, uh, to close that gap even further. Um, and you're seeing that in some of the actions that we're taking um, with more short product, um, bringing up incredible destinations like Perfect Day at Coco Cay uh, that is helping us compete with land-based vacation. And finally, representatives from various African and Caribbean entities joined forces at an historic event this week in the capital of Barbados to demand reparations for slavery and its legacy in today's society. They all teamed up to call for reparations for historical crimes. The meeting was in Bridgetown from Monday to Thursday and included strategy sessions and plenaries and marked the beginning of an intercontinental campaign. Still to come in our news today in history, find out interesting facts about the day that was July 28th. Then in our news at 7.30, Organization for Responsible Governance says put existing legislation to use to deal with the ongoing immigration saga involving the minister. Plus, a Gumbe Summer Festival grand finale on Grand Bahama when our news returns. If new, Heineken Silver was a riveting Viking soccer
Welcome back to our news. It's time now to turn on spotlight on events that shaped the day that was July 28th. Take a look. On this day in Bahamian history in 1860, the last captured ship of enslaved Africans was shipwrecked near Linyard Key off Abaco. They were first quarantined, then transported to New Providence to serve a sentence and eventually freed in what is now called Congo Town Fox Hill. Then in 1945, William Lindsay Murphy became governor of the Bahamas, succeeding the Duke of Windsor. Murphy served for five years until 1950. As governor, he officially opened the famous Lerner Marine Laboratory on Bimini, which is a field station of the American Museum of Natural History. During his time in office, the use of secret ballots in elections was extended to the outer islands in 1949. Then in 1994, the Bahamas established diplomatic relations with the Republic of South Africa. The spirit of this cooperation also served to enhance collaborative efforts in international organizations such as the United Nations. 17 years later, in 2021, offices in the Department of Social Services were shut down across the country as employees used their lunch break to protest what they called government's failure to address concerns. Employees took to the streets waving signs that read, Slavery is over. Workers had threatened industrial action if their voices were not heard. Also that same day, over 200 employees called in sick at Bahamas Power and Light as union negotiations fell through. The union was asking for millions of dollars to pay members but BPL executives refused, saying the power company did not have an extra dime to pay. And finally, in 2022, the viewing of former House Speaker Vernon Simonet was held after his passing on July 7th that year. He was first elected to Parliament in 1982 and served as MP for Inagua and Miaguana and was Speaker of the House from 1992 to 1997. <laughs> All right, well, 55 youngsters in Grand Bahama getting some first-hand experience on how to become their own boss at the Bishop Michael Eldon School this week. Coordinator for Boss Club Bahamas, Shima Williams, says they wanted to give students an early start to entrepreneurship. We had guest speakers come in from around the island, local entrepreneurs, including a young lady, Talia Fox, who started her own hair care business when she was in high school. We had filmmakers and studio producers. One of the things we realized is that no matter how gifted the students are or how smart they are or how well prepared they are for life, a lot of them were not going to be able to go off to college right away or even in the near future. And so we wanted to show them how they could start doing things for themselves and just Let's get a head start on um, learning how to start a business and run a business. In addition to coordinator for Boss Club Bahamas, Shamia Williams, these participants sharing with us what they've learned. I've learned to market my business, learn how to figure out opportunities, and know how to get solutions from different problems. I learned a lot of stuff about marketing, pricing, how to run a business, especially with partners. Me and my siblings, we have a family business called Befusion Cafe. So especially with partners, it can be difficult. It helped me to envelop, develop a business that can help me continue this in the future and also to help me make some money during the summer. 37 participants from the Bahamas Wildlife Enforcement. All right, getting ahead of us, but to those kids, obviously we wish them all the best. Young entrepreneurship, good to see. Meanwhile, 40 people graduated from the Protected Area Managers Enforcement Training course today at the Police Training College. The course included participants from multiple environmental agencies. Our Marlena Letter, you just heard, reports. 37 participants from the Bahamas Wildlife Enforcement Network, the Bahamas National Trust, the Department of Environmental Planning and Protection, the Department of Marine Resources, and the Forestry Unit graduated from the Protected Area Managers Enforcement Training Course today. Course graduates spoke highly of their experience, explaining the opportunity provided for them to understand how responsibilities are shared across the web of environmental networks in the Bahamas. We were able to form partnerships and we understand each other's agencies a lot better because before this we didn't really have a clear understanding of what we all do. But now moving away, we know that where our work ends, uh, the other organization work begins. 
The two-week course covered topics like diary keeping and report writing, classification of offenses, and intelligence gathering techniques, among others. Leron Roll is a BNT Park Warden in Andrus. I've been with this organization for six years, and I must say I've been waiting for this for a long time, Mr. Peters. Um, and I would just like to thank all our, the organizations for coming together and working with one another. Um, we understand more of our rules uh, in, in, in terms of environmental protection. Um, and I'm sure we will all be part of a network. You keep the WhatsApp group, everybody. Bahamas National Trust Executive Director Lakeisha Anderson Roll says now that they've done the course, they have to keep the momentum going. It is the BNT's commitment to continue working with all of the respective agencies present um, as we will certainly play our part in making sure there is support to be able to come together on an annual basis to ensure that all of our resource management agencies benefit from this training opportunity. Reporting for our news, I'm Marlena Leonard. Now to watch that story again and for all of today's top stories, you can visit rnews.bs. That does it for us in News at 7. Joining us now is Italia Hall with the latest headlines on Italia. I know you've got something on Gumbe coming up. Jamila, I know she went home yep. and was able to participate. Did you did you see anything, any scenes from oh, there already? It looked great. It looked like a lot of people turned out, and I'm always happy to see yeah. that in Grand Bahama. I know Lots we had a competition visitors. in the group today about yeah. who will do it better. <laughs> do you think? Grand Bahama, of course. <laughs> but hey, I'm just prejudiced because that's hey, who. But... You, you, you said you all won Bahamas games too, right? Yeah, we did. <laughs> are you, are you sure about so, that? so, but <laughs> yes, we did. You know what? <laughs> but I'm going to leave it there. I'll wait to see. Yeah, I'll wait to we'll see wait what Jamila has. <laughs> all right, thanks so much, Ken. Right. Well, Org says, put existing legislation to use to deal with ongoing immigration issues. Plus, a Gombe Summer Festival on Grand Bahama finale comes to an end. Here are your latest headlines. The conversation continues first tonight on our news live at 7.30. A local organization questioning practices at the Department of Immigration. Our Megan Shepard is following this. Also, why the Attorney General says he's committed to creating a remote court system, bringing family islands into focus. Plus, tracking your travel. How do you manage when your flight has been delayed or canceled? We have a possible solution. And later, the Gombe Summer Festival comes to an end in Grand Bahama. We've got the full story when our news live at 7.30 returns. Doctors Hospital has reimagined primary care. We have invested to improve our health system, ensuring that accessible, affordable, world-class clinical care is closer to you. Your relationship with a primary care provider shapes the foundation of your overall health. Our new, modern primary care facilities are where critical diagnosis and true personalized treatment begin. With locations across New Providence, Grand Bahama, and Exuma, we invite you to experience the Doctors Hospital difference. Book your next appointment at clinics.doctorshoss.com. If new, Heineken Silver was a riveting Viking soccer. Last the twelfth, your family tortured my first wife and stole my second favorite goat. Now you want to marry my daughter. Okay. <laughs> All the taste, no bitter endings. Smooth, fresh. Silver. Yes, I'm Italia Hall. The Organization of Responsible Governance calling for legislation with more teeth as the conversation surrounding practices at the Department of Immigration continues to draw divided opinions from the public. Org says utilizing legislation on the books could be make the difference. Megan Shepard has the details. Assistant Director at the Organization for Responsible Governance, Stefan Evans says, the situation involving Immigration Minister Keith Bell and alleged interference in his ministry's department echoes ORG's stance on anti-corruption. 
Good governance, he says, is ensuring the system does not make way for these types of situations in the future. We may never completely eradicate corruption, but we can definitely mitigate. So we have been advocating through several means, and we've released recent statements about the need for uh, increasing the budget around certain offices like the Office of the Ombudsman, Freedom of Information, Public Disclosure, Public Procurement. And although there is a legislation on the books aimed at making a difference, he says those pieces of paper need to be translated into action. We've seen the plan and we've worked with the office and we're excited to continue to work with them. But when we get uh, those key legislation actually enacted in a way that is useful and well understood by the public, it also better positions us. These measures, once put in place, he says, can improve the quality of life for all citizens. What's happening is um, over time, we will see changes in the landscape that make the country more livable. Studies talk about the fact that these measures improve not only public trust, but public participation. More people coming forward and taking responsibility for their communities. And while the trust between government and its citizens is paramount, Evans shares how this controversy may be viewed by the international community. What they're looking for is a stronger landscape of legislation and policy that helps to prevent things like this from happening. Uh, what they're looking for is also landscapes that build public trust through these very same mechanisms and measures. Reporting for our news, I'm Megan Shepard. All right, thanks for that, Megan. Well, the Court of Appeal has ordered a second trial for Bahamian businessman Dr. Rudolph King for an alleged scheme to defraud the post office savings bank of $600,000. King was acquitted in 2002 on charges of fraud by false pretenses and money laundering after a magistrate upheld a no-case submission. Prosecutors successfully appealed the decision on the basis that the magistrate's decision was flawed. Prosecutors alleged that King held five accounts at the post office saving bank, which he used to fraudulently obtain $600,000 from the post office bank by false pretenses. King is accused of altering entries in the account passbooks and withdrawing more money than he actually held in the accounts and then laundering that money by paying for services at other businesses. The offenses allegedly occurred between 2012 and 2015. Well, police need your help finding a man responsible for an armed robbery last night. Around 11 p.m. Thursday, a woman was at an ATM machine on Marathon and Robinson Roads when she was approached by a man who exited a heavily tinted black Japanese vehicle dressed in a dark hooded jacket. The suspect pulled a handgun, demanded cash, and robbed the woman of her purse, which contained an undisclosed amount of cash and other personal items. He fled the area in an easterly direction onto Robinson Road. Now, police are aggressively investigating this matter, and they are appealing to members of the public who must conduct financial transactions at ATMs to do so during reasonable hours. Attorney General Ryan Pinder addressing an issue which he described as, quote, frustrating to a constituency of our society, end quote. The fact that there are no full-time courts in some of the family islands, Pinder says, this creates a risk of having justice delayed. To leverage the administration of justice in our family islands, the Chief Justice and myself have committed to build out the remote court system throughout the country. We will secure the necessary IT equipment and facilities to allow for remote hearings and eliminate the need for magistrates to travel the islands to have circuit courts. I'm sure this has happened in Long Island. The frustration is real. We constitutionally should give access to justice without discrimination across our country. All right, as the country continues to experience inclement weather conditions, there have been some flight delays. Our news speaking with the Vice President of Operations at the Linden Pinland International Airport, Jonathan Hanna, who says summer season is always a busy time for LPIA with increased flight activity, adding that there's been some flight delays and cancellations due to weather, which he says is not abnormal. While we recently provided some tips for travelers who may be faced with a delayed flight, but if you want to keep up to date with your flight, you can check out Go242 on cable channel 242 and 205, which has all of the up-to-date airline and mailboat schedules. And as you can see right behind me, this is just a short example as to what you would see when you tune into those channels. 
And there is also weather information across the world and live traffic cameras in New Providence, which can help making traveling a little bit easier for you this summer. And as you look to track your travel this summer, it's always good to keep up with the weather as we've been experiencing some unstable conditions lately. Meteorologist Greg Thompson is in the Weather Center with a first check on weather. Greg? Yeah, Talia, we were like almost a seesaw. We had some hot temperatures, then we got Rain. some cool off. <laughs> now we're back to seeing those warm temperatures once again, as most of the weather is now out of our area. But we are pretty nice on the outside, 85 degrees, comfortable, few clouds. It's still a bit on the warm side. East to southeast winds at 12 miles per hour, and your field slight temperature is at 93. Radar and satellite composite, most of the activity, as I mentioned, are now moving across Florida. A lot of what Grand Bahama experienced early this morning. That's also pulled towards the north. That will continue to be associated with surface trough that's moving away, but there is an upper level low just to the south of us, southeast of us near Hispaniola. That will be moving our way, so we're looking for some more showers, maybe an isolated thunderstorm in the forecast for the weekend. That's your first quick look at weather. Stick with us. We'll tell you more about the weekend's forecast when we come back. Still to come on our news, the Lakaya National Park in Grand Bahama making progress since Hurricane Dorian. Our Jamila Mizik is on the ground. Plus, food security, the focus of a UN Food Systems Summit. The Bahamas making a major contribution. And 50 Bahamians recognized for their contributions to nation building. Our Sasha Lightborn talks to some honorees when our news returns. It's home to one of the longest chartered underwater cave systems in the world and an internationally recognized beach. Our Jamila Mizik, who is in Grand Bahama, tells us the Lakaya National Park is recovering well following the devastation of Hurricane Dorian. It's the second most visited park out of 32 national parks in the Bahamas. The Lukayan National Park, nestled in East Grand Bahama, boasts of up to 30,000 visitors per year prior to Hurricane Dorian. Director of Parks Ellsworth Weir says the natural attraction is making a comeback. Hurricane Dorian pretty much you know, devastated this park. Um, as you would see, all of the pine trees died, the Caribbean pine trees died. Um, 
we were left with a lagoon mm -hmm. on what was once known prior to that as, as the famous Gold Rock Beach. And we really didn't even think the, the beach was going to come back. The park, established back in 1983, features underwater caves, wetlands, and a fully functioning creek system. A lot of people don't know that there's also every vegetative zone that you would find in the Bahamas right here at Lucayan National Park. In addition to that, there's a lot of history here. Um, Lucayan National Park holds remains of the Lucayan Indians that once inhabited, inhabited this, this park or this, this area. Um, there's, they, their remains are in Burial Mound Cave. Now, if you grew up in Grand Bahama like I did, then you've probably been to this park before and you'd remember sites like Ben's Cave and Gold Rock Beach, but now they've added a welcome center and a gift shop. Um, we're hoping to have the welcome center, both the welcome center and the gift shop opened up, um, I would say by mid to late September. But a lot of persons also want shade on the beach as well. So we have plans drawn up for a type of pavilion area that can provide seating, shelter, and an area for persons to lock things up. Another thing is we want to revamp the parking lot. Reporting for our news from Grands Bahama, I'm Jamila Misik. All right, great story, Jamila. It's good to see you at home. Well, the Bahamas represented on the world stage at the UN Food Systems Summit. The organization's mission to help countries reach sustainable food systems by 2030, translating commitments into effective actions. Representing the Bahamas was Foreign Affairs Minister Fred Mitchell. He says international meetings like these are key in understanding and bettering food security in the nation. Because the Bahamas is a small state and we're part of also CARICOM as well, we have a responsibility to our people to ensure that there's food security and part of that comes with understanding how the international arena works in these matters. The main takeaway then I would say for us is that uh, from this conference, and we look forward to the conference at the UN next year, is that uh, we should keep at it because it's important for us to be at the table. Speaking in Rome, Mitchell says while international relations are important, lack of support from global financial institutions put Caribbean countries at a disservice. That there needs to be the support of the international financial institutions, which you said in your opening remarks. And the international financial institutions have put countries in the Caribbean at a disadvantage because of this GDP per capita. And when you use that as a measure, you exclude countries like the Bahamas from getting the necessary assistance from these international financial organizations. The national men's volleyball team advanced to the semifinals and John Quell Jones led the Liberty to their fourth straight win. Don't go anywhere, our sports is coming right up. A jubilee celebration. This as Professional Services Bahamas is honoring 50 Bahamians under 40. We have the details when our news returns.
This is our news. Welcome back. Despite the inclement weather on Grand Bahama Thursday, the Ministry of Tourism's Gombe Summer Festival went off with a bang last night. The final event for the summer on Tino Beach, attracting lots of visitors and tourists alike. We can walk around, we can give our money to locals in the area. We can also experience things like cracking open the conch salad, cracking open the coconut things. We don't get, don't get the experience every day. That's the response from residents on the 2023 Gombe Summer Festival in Grand Bahama. The four-week event attracted hundreds of people to Taino Beach. This year, there was lots of entertainment, as well as unique dishes from vendors. Bahamian music artist KB headlining the event on Thursday night. The crowd was also treated to the sights and sounds of Junkanoo. General Manager at the Ministry of Tourism, Grand Bahama, Nuvalari Chaudison, calling the past four weeks fantastic. I have to take my hats off to the vendors, uh, particularly those who put a new twist on some of our uh, authentic Bahamian dishes, and also uh, cra artists and craftsmen. Uh, they came out of some new, with some new stuff out of the box, and it's just been great. I, I can't ask for more. The team here on Grand Bahama Ministry of Tourism has done a wonderful job in, in uh, certainly organizing and ensuring that everything that happens here on Tino Beach happened uh, the right way. These visitors sharing their experience. We're trying to get some kung salad. We're trying to get some nice drinks and dance. I mean, uh, the food's really good. <laughs> And as you can see, I love to eat, so we're really good. And these residents believe the annual event is needed. Everybody always up all the kaya and stuff for that. Like, we need something different. If you turn around, you see the crowd. There's a serious crowd out there. And it's the last home base. Like, I had to come out. I feel like Freeport don't really have enough stuff going on right now. You know, it's always a tragedy after a tragedy. And then I feel like for all the time, so this, we actually get to bring our family together and spend time with them and actually, you know, actually be able to enjoy their presence. Because different people are here at different times. So tourists may come during the summer, but tourists also come during winter time, during school time, during spring break. And it also will give the locals something actually to do with their family because there's little things to do with your family on the island. All right, more good news coming out of Grand Bahama. And just a quick note about the Gombe Summer Festival, which was set to start tonight on Bay. Festival organizers have postponed the event due to tomorrow, rather, due to inclement weather. Today's sports update is sponsored by Michelob Ultra, distributed in the Bahamas by Jimmy's Wines and Spirits. The men's volleyball team advanced to the Caribbean semifinals and John Paul Jones and the Liberty continue to a hot streak. Here's Tej Adley with a check on sports. Tej? Thanks, Natalia. Hello, good evening, happy Friday, and welcome to Our Sports. I'm Tej Adderley here to finish off the week strong. The men's volleyball team beat Jamaica yesterday to advance to the semifinal round of the Caribbean Senior Tournament. Our senior men's volleyball team packed Martinique in straight sets, sweeping them 27-25, 25-20, and 25-14 to get the win. Kyle Wilson led Team Bahamas with 21 points. They are now on to the tournament semifinals. Meanwhile, our women lost to Jamaica yesterday to close out round robin play. They had a rematch against Jamaica earlier this afternoon in the knockout round. We'll get the score of that match as soon as we can. Another day, another double-double for John Quill Jones, and another win for the Liberty. This one came against the Atlanta Dream. John Quill Jones scored 19 points and grabbed 13 rebounds to help her New York Liberty to win against the Atlanta Dream. Her points came on a hyper-efficient 7 of 11 shooting night. She also made all four of her free throws. Rihanna Stewart led the Liberty in scoring with 33 points. She also had 11 rebounds, while Alicia Gray had 25, 8, and 6 for Atlanta. Fact. She hasn't missed a free throw since July 19th. The Liberty played the Minnesota Lynx in a couple minutes, then they're in L.A. for a doubleheader against the Sparks on Sunday and then on Tuesday. We'll have the results right here and on our website and social media. That's all for the Weekend Sports. I'm Tay Jadley. Still ahead on our news tonight, a golden jubilee celebration by Professional Services Bahamas. This as 50 Bahamians recognized for their excellence. Meet some of the honorees in a moment. But first, Greg is back with your extended weekend weather planner when our news returns. Stay with us. An ice cold Michelob Ultra, courtesy of Saw Your Airball last game. A refreshing Michelob.
Welcome back to our news. After a rainy work week, the sun is out and hopefully these nice weather conditions stay with us throughout the weekend. Well, Greg is back in the weather center with your extended forecast. Greg, what can you tell us? Nice weather, but it's going to get hot. Wow. So if you plan on doing anything on the outdoors, make sure you dress appropriately, pr appropriately drink lots of liquid. And of course, tomorrow being Goombay. Yeah. Goombay tomorrow. Should, should be, everything should, be okay? Should I know. Be, should be okay. You All might right. get a passing shower, but okay. nothing like what we had the last couple okay. of days. Sounds so. great. Taking a look at our satellite picture, that uh, surface trough that's been plaguing us for the last couple of days, that's now moved across Florida. Most of the activity is now across that area. We had some showers across Grand Bahama, the Abacos earlier. That is well to the north. The tail end of that surface trough, which is actually a tropical wave, it's in the uh, far western Caribbean. The National Hurricane Center giving that a slight chance for formation, but it's going to cross Central America, move into the Pacific before that happens. With that surface trough, there's also a low-level circulation in the National Hurricane Center giving that a low chance for formation, but that's not going to really do much because it's moving inland. The other system we're watching in the tropics, a broad area of low pressure that's in the Central Atlantic, approaching Lilywood Islands. National Hurricane Center is giving that about a medium chance for formation is expected to continue to track towards the north. This is between this weekend and early next week. And eventually there's an upper level trough, an upper level trough that will move off of Florida, or uh, the U eastern United States actually, and swing this out to the north and northwest. So it should stay in the uh, open Atlantic and what we call it become a fish storm. Nothing really else happening in the tropics. Future forecasts, spattering of just a couple of isolated showers across the area, that drier mass with the surface ridge is moving into our area. And you notice a little spin there, that's at upper level though, that's gonna be moving into our area. So that could bring us a couple of isolated showers for the weekend. Boating forecast, northwest and central Bahamas, east to southeast winds 10 to 15 north seas running 2 to 4 feet over the ocean. Your low tide will be at 11.17 tonight for the southeast Bahamas. Caution flag still down there. East to southeast winds 15 to 20 knots. They will be gusting higher times. Seas running 4 to 7 feet over open waters. Here's a look now at your national forecast. your weekend forecast we'll see maybe an isolated shower or two in the forecast tomorrow but those temperatures are going to be moving back into the 90s triple digit in disease for the next couple of days so it's going to get very warm drink lots of water are you going to go and tomorrow Greg, i don't know with those hot temperatures i'm not sure <laughs> well, but i'll see the i want to experience it be, here yeah the night times will well you you have to go to Goombay okay. on Bay Street. All right, I'll be That's there. That's Goombay. All right. <laughs> so it's going to be nice. It's going to be a little warm, but drink lots of water. All right. <laughs> All right. Thanks yeah. so much, Greg. Bragging about uh, Grand Bahama. Grand yeah, Bahama. We know. <laughs> All right. <laughs> While celebrations continue as the country observed its 50th anniversary of independence, Professional Services Bahamas is recognizing 50 of the country's top professionals under the age of 40. And one of our very own is a part of that group. Our Sasha Lightborn explains. Professional Services Bahamas celebrates 50 years of independence by recognizing 50 of the most influential and successful young professionals under the age of 40, who are the movers and shakers in the public and private sectors, influencing economic growth in our country. We caught up with several of those honorees to find out how they feel about the honor, especially during the country's 50th Jubilee year. With this being our golden jubilee, a time we're celebrating 50, we're looking back at all we've accomplished and we're looking at the road ahead to see what's next for our country. It's a reminder that there's more to be done and we're the generation to do it. Dr. Shamika Strawn says the news came to her as a shock. It was definitely a surprise. Um, I'm honored and it's very humbling. I feel like I'm a part of history. Popular comedian and entertainer Jaque Adderley is also on the list of honorees. On a regular basis, I'm reminded that what I'm doing is actually benefiting persons. Persons are enjoying it, they're loving it, and they value what I do. To know that on the a grand year, jubilee year, that I'm being recognized for my hard work, off the chains, man. And last, but by no means least, our very own Berthony McDermott is among the honorees as well. After all my years of hard work, people are beginning to notice, and I guess the level of professionalism that I try to bring to what I do every day, and going out and getting stories, telling stories, and delivering them to the best of my ability. So I think it makes it all the more better, all the more honorable that 
they decided to choose me during our 50th year. Now, a grand gala is planned to officially recognize all 50 honorees at the Margaritaville Resort. We will have more from BJ, as he is affectionately called, and the other honorees in our News Weekend Edition. Reporting for our news, I'm Sasha Lightborn. All right, thanks for that, Sasha, and congrats once again to all of the honorees and, of course, our very own, Bethany. And with that, we thank you for joining us for our news tonight. On behalf of the entire team, I'm Natalia Hall. We'll see you tomorrow night. Have a great evening.